What's up, chooms? Hope everybody had a pre-Valentine's Day this weekend with your missus who picked you to be her significant other largely in part because you decided to join Team Finasteride instead of Team Slaphead. 100 years ago, who could have imagined that a cosmetic defect as horridly aesthetically unappealing as male pattern baldness could be solved by just taking a simple pill like finasteride? Since 1992, when finasteride first hit the market, millions of men have had their minds put at ease knowing that they can solve all of their hair loss problems by just taking finasteride. For many years, there were no issues with this drug at all. People would take it knowingly, knowing that there was a very small yet acceptable risk of side effects in even if you did get side effects, you could easily mitigate those risks through titration as it, as it has been shown that finasteride is effective even at less than the standard dosage. Finasteride side effects, as we all know at this point, are rare, mild, and will often go away on their own with continued use and will always go away with discontinuation. The idea that the side effects from finasteride can be prolonged has never been medically verified, yet people still continue to fear monger because it helps them cope with being bald, miserable slapheads who have given up on life and want to drag everybody else down with them. Because remember, misery loves company. Slapheads will tell you things they know are not true, like shaving your head will make you look like Jason Statham, Vin Diesel, or The Rock, when the reality is you'll probably end up looking more like that albino kid from the movie Powder, or like that guy from the wife's boyfriend meme, and even if your aesthetics are top tier enough that you can look good despite being bald, chances are you still will drop several points in the aesthetics department since no matter how good a face may look, you need a good head of hair to frame a handsome face. That is why even bald men who look good would still look better if they had a full head of hair and that is only in the best case scenarios. For most people, the results of losing your hair are catastrophic and life destroying. I mean, sh just take a look at this video from a British dating show. And bring on the boys! <laughs> Welcome to the show, sir. Take okay. it away and give it your best shots. Hello, lady. My name is Emmett, and I'm from Roscommon. Hey! <laughs> Girls, that's Emma from Roscommon, but tell us, are you turned on or turned off? <laughs> Holy shit. I don't want to be too mean because, you know, I've been down that path before. I know how it feels. But, you know, just looking at this guy, you could tell he has other glaring problems as well, such as being weak, effeminate looking. He's a manlet. He's a new male. But you'll notice all the initial criticism from the women was aimed at this man's, this man's lack of hair. Shannon, lights off for you as well. I'm doing my best for you here. It's just the hair, the lack of, I mean, I'm sorry. So as you can see, it is hair or a lack of hair that leaves the first impression on those who meet. And nothing leaves a worse impression than when someone sees per a person who has a shaved ring of hair that looks like a toilet seat around their head, which is appropriate because in this day of age, you have got to have shit for brains to let yourself go bald. It doesn't matter what your other merits may be. If you don't give a good first impression, people may dismiss you outright and you leave a terrible first impression when you are bald. So stop. Stop fearing finasteride and start fearing what will happen to you if you don't take finasteride. So on that note, let's talk about a common concern many have, m many men have before beginning finasteride, and that is the development of gynecomastia, aka male breast tissue. So before I get into this, I think it is important that I distinguish between actual gynecomastia and pseudogynecomastia. Actual gynecomastia involves the development of breast tissue in men, whereas pseudogynecomastia is just fat distribution to the chest area, and men who get that can solve it by simply losing weight or maybe getting a liposuction. So, real gynecomastia can happen to men regardless of their body composi composition, as you often see in professional bodybuilders who get gynecomastia. Even though they're extremely lean, you'll see some female breast tissue on them. And often this is because they use supraphysiological levels of testosterone, which can then aromatize into estrogen. 
And even though this is an extreme example of how gynecomastia can happen in men, the mechanism behind finasteride possibly causing this side effect is similar, even though, as we'll see, this is an extremely rare side effect of finasteride, so the level of hysteria and concern people have over this is way overblown, but nevertheless, let's take a look at this balls deep as we always do. So, the mechanism behind finasteride is well understood at this point. We know it suppresses the type 2 5A reductase pathway that converts testosterone into dihydrogen hydrotestosterone, which is the trash hormone that makes us go bald and does a whole bunch of other really horrible things. Um, anyone who denies that DHT is the primary culprit for hair loss in men genetically predisposed to male pattern baldness at this point is sprouting complete bro science on a level equivalent to what we see from the Flat Earth Society or from anti-vaccination groups. So, as you can see in this figure, testosterone can not only be converted to DHT, but also into estrogen via the aromatase pathway. This seems counterintuitive at first, but you have to understand men do in fact need some estrogen in their body for proper joint as well as proper cardiovascular health. Logically, when you suppress the 5A reductase enzyme, that will leave you with more overall testosterone, and that is why finasteride will raise testosterone by 9 to 15% or so in most people. For most of us, this isn't an issue at all, and possibly this could even be beneficial and may explain why some people report things like higher libido while they take finasteride. However, some of this extra testosterone will be converted into a small amount of estrogen via the aromatase pathway, so estrogen levels can rise slightly as well. For most of us, this is negligible and we won't even notice it, but this could be why some people do get side effects from finasteride, such as lower libido as well as gynecomastia. So before anyone freaks out about this, let's discuss the actual incidence of gynecomastia on finasteride. How common is it really? Well, if you look at the package insert for Proscar, which is the 5 milligram tablet of finasteride as opposed to Propecia, which is a one milligram tablet, you can see that they looked not specifically at gynecomastia as a side effect, but instead they looked at the incidence of breast enlargement and breast tenderness, which are not necessarily equivalent to gynecomastia. In any case, they looked at about 1,500 patients on Proscar versus 1,500 patients on placebo and saw the breast enlargement was seen in 1.8% of patients on finasteride for up to four years versus 1.1% of patients on placebo. The incidence of breast tenderness was up to 0.7% on finasteride and 0.3% on placebo. They also included data from another study of a total of about 1,500 patients, half on Proscar and half on placebo, and they concluded that the incidence of gynecomastia was 2.2% on Proscar and 0.7% with placebo. Of course, we are talking about Proscar here, not Propecia. Propecia has the same active ingredient in it, which is finasteride, but only at one-fifth the dosage as a Proscar tablet, which has 5 milligrams of finasteride, whereas again, a Propecia has just 1 milligram. So, what does the package in insert for Propecia actually say? Well, we know it has to be rare because in the initial clinical trials, which involved thousands of subjects, there were no reported incidences of gynecomastia at all. In fact, the package insert reads, quote, in the clinical studies with Propecia, the incidences for breast tenderness and enlargement, hypersensitivity reactions, and testicular pain in finasteride-treated patients were not different from those in patients treated with placebo, unquote. So, in other words, they didn't notice anything in any of the thousands of subjects initially studied. And keep in mind, this is an FDA-approved medication we're talking about here, so the standards for approval are the most vigorous in the entire world and require hundreds of millions of dollars worth of research. However, based on the post-marketing case reports of gynecomastia from finasteride, and because of the incidence of gynecomastia on Proscar, breast tenderness and enlargement were eventually added to the list of possible adverse reactions from taking Propecia, and that's why it's on the package insert today. So, reports of gynecomastia on low-dose finasteride are only based on case reports, which are the weakest form of evidence, as we all know, as they just involve one or two subjects. So, let's look at a paper describing two such case reports. The first case report involved a 21-year-old man with androgenic alopecia who developed gynecomastia four months after starting treatment, and he was on the standard dose of one milligram per day. Upon cessation, the gyno did not resolve even after 10 months off the drug. Now, normally, I'd say any reports of prolonged side effects from finasteride are completely bogus, but in this case, we're talking about tissue development. So it is true that if you do get gynecomastia from finasteride, you may need surgery to rectify this. So this young man's case is rare, but it's not completely implausible since you can't reverse tissue development without surgery in most cases. So 
And the second case report, this paper dealt with an older individual this time. He was 65 years old, uh, and he had androgenic alopecia. It wasn't specified how severe it was, but he had, but he developed gynecomastia after two months of treatment, and his case was unilateral, meaning only one breast was enlarged. Fortunately for him, though, the side effects did dissipate after two months off treatment, but he still had some very slight swelling six years after stopping treatment, and this was probably as a result of some breast, breast tissue uh, development that never completely resolved even after he stopped taking the drug. So he probably would need surgery as well. So in this paper, they also reviewed the literature on gynecomastia with finasteride. In table one, you can see the incidence of gynecomastia in patients treated with five milligrams per day of finasteride. In the largest study involving over 14,000 patients, the reported incidence of gynecomastia was only 0.3%, namely 42 out of 14,722 patients. I, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I think I'd take those odds, especially since we're talking about Proscar, not Propecia. And keep in mind, the standard dose of finasteride for treating male pattern baldness is only one-fifth of what was used in these studies. And furthermore, many people report success on even smaller doses. Another thing worth pointing out was that gynecomastia was listed as the third most common side effect in that study, so they were accounting for all the other reported side effects from finasteride. So if the third most common side effect from finasteride only affects 0.3% of patients, that gives you an idea of just how rare side effects from finasteride are in general, even at a dose of 5 milligrams per day, which no men should be using for hair loss. Just 1 milligram or less per day is totally fine. Of the other studies in this table, as you can see, though, the highest incidence was 4.5% in a study of 9,423 patients, and the lowest was 0% in a study of 70 patients. But again, in the largest study by far, the incidence was only 0.3%. They then show a table showing the incidence of gynecomastia from using dutasteride, which is interesting. Dutasteride, even though it isn't as well studied as finasteride for fighting hair loss, especially long-term, is still known to suppress more DHT than finasteride, so it may possibly increase estrogen levels more since there will be even less testosterone being converted into DHT and more converted by aromatase into estrogen compared to finasteride. So if you look at the table, you can see the studies have a similar but smaller sample size compared to the finasteride studies, but they seem to show a higher incidence of gynecomastia with all the studies except for a small study involving 68 patients showing zero cases, which could be a classic argument as to why having a large sample size is so important for these kind of studies. The other studies, however, show an incidence of gynecomastia ranging from 1 to 2.3%, which is still small, but nevertheless many times as high as what the large largest finasteride study showed. So personally, I think the risk of both these drugs are low enough to the point where you shouldn't be concerned. But if you are really worried about gynecomastia, it would probably be safer to use finasteride rather than dutasteride, because even though the incidence of side effects is low with dutasteride, it's many times lower with finasteride. So both are low, but finasteride's chances are even lower. So Anyways, we've looked at finasteride at 5 milligrams as well as dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams, but what about finasteride at 1 milligram daily as that is the standard dosage for androgenic alopecia? Well, in this table here, you can see that all we have are case reports and no large clinical trials showing gyno as a side effect of propecia. So interestingly, all these case reports show that the gynecomastia was unilateral, meaning again, just one breast was getting gyno for some reason. The age of onset in the subjects was mostly pretty early on with, with most of them getting gyno as early as two to six months with one uh, case of a, uh, just one case of somebody getting it after 11 months. So if you're already on finasteride and have been on it for like over a year, let's say, then the chances you'll get gyno seem to be pretty null. Fortunately for these subjects though, it looks like most of their gyno resolved upon stopping treatment within at most 10 months or so. The other thing to note is that the age of these patients was fairly young, ranging from 18 to 29 years old with only one patient being on the old older side at 53 years of age. Now, this is speculative, but I think this may have to do with younger men having higher baseline testosterone levels to begin with. So if someone is really young and virile, then it could be that the very small boost in testosterone they get from finasteride is enough for it to aromatize to a greater degree than if an older individual gets it, since we know that testosterone drops a little bit as you get older. Again, though, I must go back to the first table and emphasize that gynecomastia was only reported in 0.3% of patients 
in a sample size of over 14,000 patients on 5 milligrams of finasteride daily, not 1 milligram. So if you are a young man, don't interpret this as a red flag to not use finasteride. Another way to look at this is that this is just a handful of case reports, and we know that there are millions of people on finasteride for hair loss. So again, it seems the incidence of gynecomastia on 1 milligram of finasteride daily must be exceptionally low, certainly nothing to panic over. So, as you can see from the available research, gynecomastia, like all of finasterides reported side effects, are dramatically overblown because people want to exaggerate their side effects because they're trying to sue Merck. However, that being said, I don't want to come across as being completely dismissive to the few people who do in fact get gynecomastia as a result of taking finasteride. But keep in mind, there is no underlying predictor to find out whether or not certain people are more apt to get gynecomastia from finasteride compared to other people. People can develop gynecomastia during puberty, for instance, but the endocrine system in an adolescent young man still undergoing development is not the same as an adult suppressing their DHT through finasteride. So just because you got gyno during puberty doesn't mean you're going to make it worse or get it again if you take finasteride. There are a lot of shifts in the hormone and endocrine system levels during puberty before the hormone hormones finally stabilized in adulthood, so there are a whole plethora of factors that could cause kyno during uh, adolescence that wouldn't apply to an adult taking finasteride. Also, you don't need blood work before starting finasteride if you're already a healthy individual. If you have some pre-existing endocrinological problem like hypogonadism or Kleinfel Kleinfelter syndrome, then you might be at a greater risk, but if that were the case, you'd probably already have other symptoms, in which case you should be speaking with an endocrinologist to get those problems resolved to begin with, like going on TRT. People who are hypogonadal will almost always have symptoms, and to screen everyone starting finasteride for hypogonadism would not be cost effective and basically would just be a big waste of time and money. And if you're already so scared of getting gyno from finasteride that you feel that you need to get blood work even though we've already established it affects fewer than 0.3% of users, then chances are you're at a very high risk to give yourself a nocebo effect, in which case you probably shouldn't use finasteride because the last thing we need in the hair loss community are more people spreading fear and misinformation about this drug. There's plenty of that already. So let's assume though uh, the absolute worst case scenario has happened to you and you're one of the very few people who get gyno from finasteride. So what can you do? Well, the first most obvious thing you can do is adjust your titration. Finasteride standard dose is one milligram daily, but it is common for doctors to prescribe less than that and at a lower frequency, such as 0.5 milligrams or 0.25 milligrams daily or every other day, and patients still report success while potentially mitigating side effects. Being that five milligrams of finasteride only has a 0.3% chance of causing gyno, then it seems like the chances on just a fraction of that would be very low, unfathomably low in fact, but failing that, what else can you do? Well, there are prescription aromatase inhibitors you can use like Arimidex or Letrozole, although these drugs are considered very cardiovascular friendly, meaning they have the tendency to raise our cholesterol levels. Although keep in mind, a doctor who would prescribe you an aromatase inhibitor for something like Gano would probably do so in an adjusted titration, which might mitigate these risks, although none of these drugs are completely risk-free. Another drug that could be prescribed would be something like Tamoxifen, which is also known as Nolvidex, which has a similar outcome but different mechanism as it is not an aromatase inhibitor, but rather it is a SERM, not to be confused with SARMs. SERM stands for Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator, which works as an estrogen receptor antagonist in the breast tissue. Unfortunately, Nolvidex isn't very side effect friendly either, and one of its reported side effects is even hair loss, which kind of defeats the purpose of using finasteride to begin with. So there are also numerous over-the-counter dietary supplements and reported natural natural aromatase inhibitors, but none of these have been proven effective. So if you are an individual who gets gynecomastia from finasteride, I think the best solution would be to opt for something like surgery. Gynosurgery isn't super expensive, and you can ask the doctor to remove the gland altogether so that you'll never be at risk for gynecomastia ever again. Frankly, I think that is a safer option than trying to counter one drug side effects with another drug, especially something like tamoxifen or arimidex. You know, nobody wants to 
spend a few thousand dollars for a surgery, but gyno surgery is still cheaper than a hair transplant. So if for some reason you can't get around the gyno side effects, I think surgery is a good idea. So anyways, I don't think there really is anything more to talk about regarding this subject. You know, gyno from finasteride, we know it's not common, and the level of fear and paranoia people feel about this extremely rare side effect is way out of proportion to reality. You know, gyno is rare, it is reversible with surgery, and if the extremely low odds of getting gyno are still too great for you, just remember what happened to this guy and ask yourself, is that who I want to be? Nadine, what happened? He kind of looks a bit old and he's baldy like me da and... <laughs> okay, folks, till next time, take care.